Welcome back to the Simulator series. In today's episode, we will begin implementing some sounds. Now, before we end the studio, we're going to want to go down below in the description and follow the link to this webpage right here, which includes a download button and allows us to download a zip file which contains a couple of different sounds. Now, this can be accessed for completely free. You don't even need to sign up for an account. Just visit this page, make sure you're on the information tab, which you should be by default, and click the download button right here, and it should download the Clicking Simulator sound pack.zip for you. Once you've downloaded it, make sure you have extracted the zip file, and then inside of there, you should see a couple of different sound files, which are of the OGG format. Now, keep in mind that all all these sounds were actually found from the free sound website. So if you want to find any more sounds, this is a pretty good resource that you can certainly use. When you go to search for a sound, what I would recommend is you select the very specific license that fits your needs. I went with Creative Commons, which pretty much allows you to do anything you want with it. But yeah, that's the only thing that I'd make sure you keep in mind is that you use sounds that you actually have the rights to use. Roblox even has its own sounds, which you can access from the Creator Hub. And when you're looking for sounds in here, what I would recommend that you do is you actually filter by Roblox created sounds, because I'm pretty sure all Roblox created or uploaded sounds you can use for completely free on their platform. So you don't have to worry about copyright or licensing or anything else like that as long as you are using Roblox's sounds. And I'll leave a link down below in the description to this store page. In my opinion, it wasn't really that intuitive to access. I think the only way to access this page is you actually have to go through the creator hub and then click the store button. And then you get access to looking for models, plugins, audio, and different things like that. You could even use the Roblox Studio toolbox to look for different sounds, but I found that the toolbox can perform much worse than their actual website for presenting these things to you. But either way, there's a couple of different methods that you can easily find different sounds for your game. Now that we have our sounds downloaded, the next thing that we wanna do is actually upload these to Roblox Studio so that we can use them inside of our games. So in order to do this, we want to go to the view tab and select the asset manager. Inside of the asset manager, we have the bulk import button, which we can go ahead and click on. Then we want to go to the folder, which contains all of our different sound files. We can go ahead and select all of these and click on open. You might then be prompted to confirm that you do actually own all of the rights to upload these sounds. And since we do, we're going to go ahead and click on confirm. And once we do that, we should see them being uploaded for us. And as long as you get all green check marks, then you do know that these have been uploaded correctly. So we can go ahead and close out of that page. Then we want to go ahead and actually add these sound objects into our game so that we can easily play them. So to do this, we're going to go inside of the replicate storage and we're going to make a brand new folder, which we're going to call sounds. Then inside of here, we're going to go ahead and create a sound instance. And then we want to rename this sound instance to one of our sounds. So I'm going to go ahead and rename this to be called error. Since we still have the asset manager open, we're going to go ahead and right click on the error sound that we just added to our game. And we're going to click on copy ID to clipboard. We'll then look at the properties of our error sound instance, and we can go ahead and paste the sound ID into the sound ID property. You should then see the is loaded property set to true and the actual time length being updated as well. You can then go ahead and play a preview of this and you should actually hear the sound being played. If you don't hear the sound being played, you may need to start your game inside of Roblox Studio, then hit escape and actually modify your sound setting on here. So make sure your volume is not turned all the way down, otherwise you might not be able to hear it. Now, because all the sounds that we're going to be using mostly have to do with GUIs and things like that, we're not really gonna physically insert any sound objects into our game. Like for instance, if we added a sound onto our pet index right here and only played that sound when players got close to it, that's kind of what I mean by like a physical sound. Because with physical sounds, that's where you can actually modify the emitter property here, and this will affect how those sounds are played in regards to the player's physical location inside of the game. You can look at the playback properties, and we do have a couple of different properties here that you may want to modify. Like loop, for example, will force this sound to continuously play even after the first time that it is played. Normally, when we play sounds inside of Roblox, we just use the play method of the sound instance, and then after it plays one time, it'll stop. But if it is set to looped, then the only way to get it to stop would actually be calling the stop method on it. Of course, you can modify the playback speed to make it play quicker. The playing property will be set to true when the sound is actually being played. The time position is also updated as the sound is being played. And then finally, we have the volume, which I don't even really think I have to explain, but that is how loud the sound actually is. And I usually like to start all of my sounds off at one rather than 0.5, but of course, feel free to listen to the sounds and make any adjustments that you think would be better. Now, we're not actually gonna be using sound groups in this video, but I think that they are pretty useful and a cool thing to learn about. So if we scroll down in our Explorer, we should actually be able to see the sound service right here. Inside of here, we can go ahead and create a sound group. And let's go ahead and rename this to be called UI. We can also make another sound group and you don't actually have to follow along with doing this in studio. This is mostly just to demonstrate how you can actually use these and how they can be handled. So we can create another sound group, which would be called player. So now we have two different sound groups. One is called UI and the other is called player. For the UI sound group, we would of course add different sounds which are only tied in or used by different GUIs. 
Whereas for the player sound group, we would only attach sounds which relate to the player. So things like jumping, maybe if we have a custom dying sound, or different things like that, then we would set the sound group property of the sound instance to those specific sound groups. Now, where do sound groups become useful at? Well, that's actually the volume property. So let's say for instance that we actually set the sound group of the error sound to the UI sound group. So now that we've made the error sound a member of the UI sound group, the sound group's volume property actually acts as a modifier on the original sound instance. Now, I'm just pulling this description directly from the documentation. So let's say, for example, our sound instance's volume is 0.5. And now if we take a look at our sound group, the volume of this is set to 0.5 as well. And since the sound group's volume is actually a multiplier of the instance's volume, then that means that the actual volume of the sound object would become 0.25. Now, considering it's a multiplier, that might make things a little bit more confusing. So I would recommend that you check out the documentation on this because it's actually really good and pretty easy to learn through there. But anyways, kind of the whole advantage of using sound groups is it allows you to easily balance out different types of sounds in your game. But of course, that also requires you to make a GUI for players to easily manage that. Like for instance, it's pretty common in AAA or usual video games, aside from Roblox games, to actually give you a settings menu and modify different different groups of audio. So you can change the overall volume of all sound effects without affecting, say, the background music, for example. That is where sound groups actually come in handy. Anyways, like I said, we're not going to be using sound groups in this video, so I'm going to go ahead and delete both of those, and I'll also clear out the sound group for the error sound instance as well, and we'll get back to creating the rest of the sound instances. Again, I'm going to set the volume back to one as well, because that's what we had it at previously. And now, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate the sound instance and create a new one. The next one we're going to create is going to be called Rebirth. Then I'll go ahead and copy the ID, paste it inside of here, duplicate it once again. We'll rename this one to be called Menu Click, and I'll paste the ID right there. We'll duplicate it again. I'll rename it to be called Confirm. I'll go ahead and copy and paste in the ID. And now our last sound is going to be called Upbeat Loop. I'm going to discard the number one at the end of it, and I'll go ahead and paste in the ID. Now, the upbeat loop is actually going to be the sound that we use for music inside of our game. So we want to modify one property on this, and that is the looped property. Because again, with the loop property being enabled, that means that every single time the sound has finished playing, it'll automatically restart playing from the beginning once again. And because of how this sound is actually designed, you really can't even tell when it actually restarts playing. So we can easily use it to kind of make a nice repetitive background music. Anyways, now that we've added all of our sounds to our game, I'm going to go ahead and exit out of the asset manager. So now that we've added those sounds to our game, we can actually get started with scripting and using them. I'm going to go ahead and collapse the replicated storage because we're not going to use that anymore. And instead, I'm going to go inside of the starter player, inside of the starter player scripts, and inside of here, we're going to go ahead and create a brand new local script. Now, we'll go ahead and rename this local script to be called music, because inside of the script, we are going to go ahead and set up the music. Now, of course, the first thing that we want to do in here is to create some variables for some services. So, of course, we want to go ahead and create a variable for the replicate storage, and that's actually the only service we'll be using inside of here. Now, we have to think pretty far back to when we created the settings episode, because our game actually has a music setting so that players can enable or disable if they want to listen to music or not. And since we created this setting, we are going to actually use the settings config to interact with it. So we're going to go ahead and create a variable for the settings config. Of course, that's inside of the replicated storage inside of the configs folder, and it is the settings module. Along with creating a variable for that module, we also want to require the state manager as well, which is inside of the replicated storage inside of the client folder, and that is called state. Let's go ahead and update the variable name to be called state manager. And now we need to create two more simple variables. The first one is going to be for remotes, which of course is inside of the replicated storage. And we also need to create a variable for the sounds folder, which is inside of the replicated storage as well. Now we've gotten all those variables. Let's go ahead and create a function which we'll use to actually toggle playing the music or not. So we're going to go ahead and call this play music and it's not going to have any parameters. Now, the first thing we want to do inside of this function is actually create a variable called sound, and we're going to set that to the specific sound instance that we want to play. And the specific sound instance that we want to play is inside of the sounds folder, and that is the upbeat loop sound. Now that we've gotten the sound that we want to play, the next thing that we want to do is actually check if the player has the music setting enabled. So we'll create a variable called isMusicEnabled, and to determine if it's enabled or not, we're going to use the settings config, and we'll use the isSettingActive function. Now, for the first argument, we need to actually pass through the setting name, which is going to be music, and for the second argument, we need to pass through the player's data. So we'll say state manager .get data. Now that we've gotten that, we want to do something specific if the setting is enabled. Now, if the setting is enabled, we want to check if it is already being played so that we don't restart it. So we can create a variable called is already playing. And to determine if it's already playing, well, the sound instance has a property on it called playing. And now we only want to play the sound if it is not already being played. So if not is already playing, then, and then let's go ahead and play the sound. So that's all we want to do to actually play the music for the player. But then after that, but still inside of the is music enabled if statement, we can go ahead and say else. 
And if the player has the music setting disabled, then we actually want to stop the sound from playing. So we can go ahead and call the stop method on the sound. And that's actually all that we're going to do to create this function. Now that we've created this function, we're going to go ahead and call this function when the script runs for the first time. But in addition to that, we also want to call this function whenever the player toggles that specific setting on or off. And to do this, we can actually use a remote event, which is the update setting remote event. So we can say dot on client event, call and connect, create an anonymous function inside of here. And the first thing that will get sent to us is actually the setting. And now the first thing that we want to do is check if the setting is the music setting. So we'll create a variable called is music setting. And to determine that, we would check if the setting is music. And now if it is the music setting that has been toggled, what we'll then do is use a task.delay0 and then we'll call the play music function. Of course, we have to use task.delay0 because the play music function uses our state and we need to make sure that we call this function after the state has actually been updated. And with that being said, that's all that we actually have to do inside of here. So we can go ahead and close out of that local script. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is create a script for setting up sounds anytime we click on a GUI button. So inside of the starter player scripts, we're going to go ahead and add a brand new local script and we're going to call this sound. And of course, inside of here, we're going to want to create a variable for a few different services. So we're going to want to get the player service and we're also going to want to get the replicated storage service as well. After that, we'll go ahead and create a variable for the local player. So we'll say players.localPlayer. We'll also create a variable for the player GUI. So we'll say player colon wait for child, and then we'll wait for the player GUI to be loaded. Then we'll create a variable for our sounds which is inside of the replicated storage. And then we'll go ahead and create a variable for the specific sound that we're going to use, which is inside of the sounds folder, and we want to use the menu click sound. So now that we've done that, we're going to go ahead and create a function for setting up the buns. And we're going to call this setup button sound. And for our parameter, we're going to accept a button, which is going to be of the GUI button type. Now you might be confused by what a GUI button is because we've never like really used one before, but basically the text buttons and image buttons both extend from the GUI button. So using this type basically saves us the time and allows us to avoid writing both of these buttons here. So that's why we can just write the GUI button because both of them actually come from the GUI button type. Now I kind of lied to you a little bit about the parameter. We're not always going to pass through buttons to this function. So the first thing that we want to do inside of here is actually create a variable called is button and make sure that the thing that we're going to work with is actually a button. And to do this, what we would do is use the is a method on the instance that we pass through to here. And we want to check if it is a button. And now if it is a button, then what we want to do is we want to listen for it to be clicked on. And whenever it's clicked on, we're going to go ahead and play the sound. So we're just going to go ahead and say sound play inside of here. And now whenever that button is clicked on, it's going to go ahead and play the sound. And that's all that we're going to do inside of this function. Now to get this all set up correctly, what we're going to do is we're actually going to listen to an event on the player GUI. And that event is called descendant added. And you might not have used this event before, but actually pretty much every single instance has this event. And this event is fired whenever something is parented to it. Of course, there's also child added, but that would only be fired whenever something directly under that instance has been parented to it. But with the descendant added, we can get notified when anything has been parented to even something inside of that instance. So we'll go ahead and connect to this. And what is this event going to pass to us? It'll pass to us the descendant that has been added to it. And what do we want to do whenever a descendant has been added? Well, we want to go ahead and call the setup button sound function and pass through the descendant. Now, actually, because of how we had it set up, we can actually make this even more compact and simply just pass through the setup button sound function just like that. Now, since this function is only going to be called whenever descendants are added to the player GUI, we also want to loop through all of the descendants that are already inside of the player GUI just in case any buns have already been replicated. We don't want to miss out on those. So we're going to go ahead and say for underscore comma, and I'm going to specify the type of this just because it makes our scripting easier. And I'm going to say that it is a GUI button in the player GUI instance, and then we'll use the get descendants method on it, and then we'll say do. Then we'll go ahead and call the setup button sound function and pass through the descendant. Now that I think about it, we really didn't have to specify the type of this. I did that originally because I was creating the function a little bit differently, and I just realized that actually was not necessary at all. So you could either leave it or delete it. It doesn't really matter. But with that being said, that's all that we have to do inside of the script. So now whenever we click on any GUI button in our game, that will make the menu click sound that we specified here. Another thing that you could do to kind of enhance this a little bit is you could effectively set up different sounds that'll play based on which button is actually clicked. So we could create a variable called is exit button. And then what we would do is we would check if the name of the button is called exit. And then inside of where we listen for the button to be clicked, we would say if is exit button, then 
play click sound. Otherwise, we'll use an else statement and then we'll say play the normal sound. So that's just an example of how you can get even more specific on this and only play specific sounds with specific buns clicked. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and undo that. But of course, if you want to keep that in your code, you certainly can and expand on it. But I'm going to go back to what our original code was, which is all of this right here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and exit out of the script because we are done with that. The next thing that I'm going to go over is how we can easily add sounds to a lot of common events in our game. And that's kind of not a great description. I don't know any better way to say it. But basically, we have an error and a confirm sound. Now, let's consider when we would actually play these sounds. In my opinion, we would play the confirm sound whenever the player clicks on a confirm button, for example, maybe when they've actually successfully purchased something. And then alternatively, if the player is unable to afford something that they're trying to purchase, then we would play the error sound. Or if they're trying to equip too many pets, but they're unable to carry any more, then we would play the error sound as well. Now, not too many episodes ago, we set up the notification system. And we tied in the notification system with a lot of different systems that use different things like that. Like if the player cannot afford something, then they get notified using the notification system. So rather than going to each individual system and adding the sound into there, which you definitely could do, a lot of those actions are centralized in one location, so we could just go right there and set up our sounds right inside of there. Rather than going inside of the star player scripts this time, we actually store the notification script inside of the replicated storage inside of the client folder. So let's go ahead and open up the notifications module. And now inside of here, we want to go ahead and create a variable for the replicated storage. Then what we're going to do is go inside of the create function, and we're going to add this logic to the very bottom of this function. And now how we can easily play a specific sound based on the notification is of course we could create if statements using the text, but rather than doing that, I'm actually going to go ahead and use the color. So if the color is green, then we most likely want to play a good sound, which would be the confirm sound. And if the notification is red, then we most likely want to play that error sound or something negative. So we're going to say if color equals red, and now we're going to go ahead and play the error sound. So inside of the replicate storage is the sounds folder, and that is where the error sound is. Then we can go ahead and play that. Then we'll say else if, and now if the color is green, then we'll go ahead and play the positive sound, which would be confirm. And that's actually all that we have to do inside of here to cover a wide range of systems. So we can go ahead and close out of the notification script. And now there's one more place that I want to implement this. And this is actually when the player rebirths. So to implement this, we want to go inside of the starter player scripts, inside of the GUI script, then we want to go inside of the rebirth folder and open up the rebirth script. Now, what I'm going to do is actually go all the way towards the very bottom of the script and then go up a little bit. And we're actually going to use the update rebirth remote event to play the sound when the player rebirths. So whenever the update rebirth function is called, we're going to go ahead and play the sound. So we're going to say replicate storage dot sounds dot rebirth, and then we'll go ahead and play it. And now with all that being said, we've implemented all the sounds into our game. So we can go ahead and close out of the script and hop right into our game and test it out. And once you answer your game, depending on if you already had the music setting toggled or not, you should hear the music. But if you don't, then you probably want to go to your settings and actually toggle the music setting on or off. And we can even hear that when we're clicking these GUI buns that we actually hear that sound as well. So yeah, we can clearly see that we've implemented all these sounds correctly. And I know that there's a lot of other areas that we could have implemented sounds to as well, but I feel like they're very easy to implement. And as long as you have whatever sound that you want to, you can easily throw that into whatever system that it needs to be thrown into. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, with all that being said, that's going to be it for this episode. As always, if you did enjoy it, Make sure you go down below and hit that like button. And if you want to support me as well as gain access to all the scripts that we made during the series and a ton of other assets that you can use to easily make your next Roblox game, feel free to visit my Patreon or monster.dev and support me. Anyways, with all that being said, I hope that you have a great day and I'll see you guys in the next episode.